So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sharon Whiteman. Uh, this is uh, the seventh in a series of interviews that we're hosting from the Lyme Disease Association on, on behalf of Australian Sick with Australian Lyme Disease and Associated Infections. Today, we're very privileged to have Mary Beth Pfeiffer. And just to give you, if you haven't, uh, just incredible work in North America and definitely her work affects us here in Australia, but I'll give you a little bit about her background. Now, Mary Beth reported for 30 years for the Plowkeepsie Journal where her Lyme articles were first published. Her previous book is Crazy in America, The Hidden Tragedy of the Criminalized Mentally Ill, which has been called a testament to the inhumanity of prison solitary confinement. She resides in the Hudson Valley of New York. Her Lyme disease articles have also appeared in the Scientific American, the Toronto Globe and Mail, Aeon Magazine, Newsday, Huffington Post, and elsewhere. Mary Beth Pfeiffer is the author of Lyme, the First Epidemic of Climate Change. She has been a journalist for four decades. Since 2012, she emerged as the leading investigative reporter in the US on Lyme disease, attracting national and international attention and garnering seven awards for her groundbreaking articles on this tick-borne scourge. Reviewers have called her book superbly written and researched, a powerful wake-up call and a work of breadth and depth, impressively and documented and elegant. So Mary Beth, um, I know you've got a very busy schedule. We had to mm -hmm. juggle it a bit to make sure we found a mutual time. And I'm so grateful that you're willing to give, you know, Australians sick with this and their families and their doctors. So, well, and you know, the other thing that drives me is those future people who may uh, mm -hmm. become infected with this disease. We, we really need to fight for them as well. Yes, and we need to protect our children since children are the leading um, group of people who are infected um, every year. Um, and we frankly aren't doing enough on so many levels with this disease, including preventing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy to talk to you about this problem, which is shared in many countries worldwide. You're very far away from me and in a very different time zone, but um, ticks are where you live and so are their diseases. Absolutely. So what, what happened to cause you to become a champion for Lyme disease? Well, I have been an investigative reporter for about 30 years. Um, I wrote many different series of articles. Um, I had what I, I think we investigative reporters call the fire in the belly. Um, we didn't like to see governments taking advantage of people, of people being victimized by law enforcement, um, being put in prisons where they didn't belong. Um, I even wrote articles on um, puppy mills and people who had bought um, adorable little puppies and wound up spending thousands of dollars because they were sick and it was because of the way they had been bred. Um, so I, I wrote about many, many different um, subjects over the years, child abuse and waste of taxpayer dollars and so on. But, you know, it took me a long time to get to writing about Lyme disease, even though I live in an area of the world, the Hudson Valley, about 100 miles north of New York City, that has among the highest rates of Lyme disease. And um, the reason it took me so long to get to um, writing about Lyme disease is because I, I think I had that very false image in my head of what Lyme disease was and the image that many people share around this country and around the world. And that is that um, you know, it's a minor sort of nuisance disease. You get bitten by a tick. Um, you go to the doctor, you get diagnosed, you get a, you know, a couple of weeks of antibiotics. And, you know, with some exceptions, you go on your way. And I was aware of those exceptions in my own personal dealings with people I, I knew and were very close to. I had learned of horror stories years ago related to Lyme disease, people who didn't get well, um, people who, um, whose lives were derailed by it and had a drop out of college and had just all sorts of lingering problems. But I thought that those were the exceptions to the rule. 
I thought that um, by and large, we had Lyme disease figured out. And, you know, the reasons why those people didn't do well were sort of, um, you know, just anomaly. But when I began to look into Lyme disease, I found that frankly, it had all the markings of an investigative story. I didn't think so going in. I was just going to sort of check out this, you know, um, illness and the numbers going up and what we were spending on it and how we were preventing it. Instead, I found um, lots of different elements of an investigative story. I found um, waste of taxpayer dollars. We weren't really spending the money in any meaningful way to control this epidemic. I found denial of science. Uh, there was published science that suggested that Lyme disease lingered in the body, that the treatments that we were putting forward for it uh, didn't work so well, that the test that was being endorsed by the highest levels of our public health establishment didn't work. I found this sort of mismatch between the view of Lyme disease that had been put out by public health institutions, by medicine, by government, and what was happening on the ground in terms of patients. And that's frankly what kept me going on this. I found people who you um, know and examples of which you could point to in Australia, who had gone to doctor after doctor after doctor after being bitten by a tick. And they were told that uh, they had, there was nothing wrong with them. They'd been treated for Lyme disease. The Lyme spirochete is gone from their bodies. No problem anymore. Um, so, you know, on behalf of these people who could not get help and for whom there was a lot of evidence to support that they still had Lyme disease and that they weren't being treated for it and that there should be a better model for Lyme disease care. That's why I kept going on this um, endeavor, which eventually um, led after I left the Poughkeepsie Journal, uh, taking an early retirement in 2015 to a book. And, and while I have written a book, and while I talk a lot in many venues about my book and about this problem, I'm no longer in it to try and, um, you know, put my book out there, which isn't, you know, a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. What I'm in it for is to change this. We need to do this different from how we've done it for the last 40 years. Absolutely. I can identify with that. Um, mm -hmm. We had a quick chat before we started. I'm so driven by the injustice of this. And, you know, also um, you mentioned children. I have three children and they have uh, the potential for um, congenital Lyme. And I've worked really hard on their immune system to keep them above that. But I can see little signs. And, you know, if we don't change something in Australia, they're going to be in big trouble in the future. So what about you? What drives you through the challenges with this sort of med medical and health policy failures that you must be confronted with on a daily basis? Well, you know, I get emails from around the world. Um, and many of them have this same kind of theme running through them. Um, they're, they're so similar that it's, it's kind of scary. Um, so what keeps me going is um, the fact that we have work to do. And I, I think that I and, and many others in the Lyme establishment, in the Lyme community, have identified what holes need to be filled and have done a lot of work on filling those gaps. And, you know, I go to conferences, I, I, I talk to the major scientists who are working on this problem, uh, the physicians who really have read the, um, both sides of the uh, Lyme literature, if you will, um, the, the accepted kind of dogma that's been put out by the Infectious Disease Society of America uh, on the one side, but also the um, scientific uh, journal articles and findings that are challenging that Lyme dogma. Um, and what I see and what's keeping me going is that there's still a lot of work to be done, but things are happening. Yeah. 
And I'm really happy to, you know, report to you um, the findings uh, that I've come across very recently um, of a, a um, survey that I've done of about, um, so far I have 67 responses to a survey that I sent to, frankly, the world's leading scientists, physicians, and Lyme disease advocates. Um, I think I've covered about um, 10 or 11 countries right now, three continents, including Australia. And while the situation is dire in Australia uh, and in some other countries where the, people simply cannot get treatment, Sweden is another one. There's not a single doctor, I'm told there, um, who specializes in Lyme disease. Um, and while that's true um, for you, things are changing in the United States and in some European countries. And if they change appreciably here, I believe they're gonna change globally. So the answers, the responses of these scientists and these physicians and these Lyme disease advocates to my survey um, basically shows um, that people have a lot of hope now um, that they didn't have um, five years ago, that they didn't even have in many cases two or three years ago. A lot of things are coming together right now. And kind of the themes that have emerged from these, uh, I've done about three or 400 emails now uh, and uh, a few dozen um, actually on the phone interviews to pull together all this data. Um, and I will publish it as an article probably in the next month or two. Uh, it's all coming together. But, you know, there's been recognition that the test doesn't work. That's finally been accepted. Even um, IDSA types who I interviewed early in my research back in 2012, when I started looking into Lyme disease, these folks were defending that test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works but it just doesn't work early. You just have to wait a little while. Um, that, that was kind of the defense. Or, well, you know, early on you get the rash, so, you know, you don't need the test. Um, they basically defended the diagnostic model. They're not defending it to that same extent anymore. And there's a lot of uh, different science that's emerging on that suggests we're going to have a way to diagnose Lyme disease that will be reliable in the next few years. Is it imminent? No. Um, but another um, thing that's really been called a breakthrough um, is um, certain treatments that we're using for Lyme disease. Um, some of your um, listeners uh, and viewers may have heard of disulfiram. It's a very old, very inexpensive drug, also called antabuse that um, was used for alcoholism. Um, alcoholics were given it, and if they ingested alcohol, they become very ill. So they have this conditioned response not to, um, while they were on this drug, to have alcohol. Um, but in experiments that have been done at a number of leading universities, like Stanford in California, like Northeastern, um, like um, Johns Hopkins, researchers are taking um, a, a wide variety of antimicrobial drugs and even other um, um, compounds and drugs, um, an anti-leprosy drug, for example. They are exposing the Lyme disease bug in test tubes to these drugs, and they're finding what works the best. And um, they've come up with drug combinations that are more effective than what we traditionally use for Lyme disease, namely doxycycline, which falls down on the job all too often. Um, and they also found that the, in at least one of the um, uh, experiments, disulfiram was the single most effective compound in killing the Lyme disease spirochete. That's led to um, doctors in the US, including one in New York that I, I know well, Dr. Uh, Kenneth Liegner, I'm doing a small um, study of patients. He, he did three case studies. He published them. He found disulfiram worked really well. Other doctors are now using it. And Columbia University um, has gotten a grant 
to do a clinical trial of disulfiram. This is the first clinical trial um, on human beings in, um, since 2008 uh, for Lyme disease. So that's a big, big step forward. There are other things that we can talk about as we go on. I don't want to monopolize uh, the conversation, but there are things that are happening that do give us hope that we are going to get out of this problem. Is there, you know, big resistance? Is there still uh, a school of thought that we have this disease covered? Yes. <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do. But um, this, you know, these responses have given me hope um, that things are moving in a positive direction. Oh, wow. Fantastic. And going back to the history, I guess, what, what do you believe is the foundation of the controversy and the bias and the dogma that's so vicious and voracious across the planet mm -hmm. in regards to this disease? Yeah, I'm asked that in every um, talk I give, and I've given, you know, probably 40 or 50 um, at this point. Um, but what I, I, I think is that we have a, uh, a powerful, well-connected group of physician researchers who sort of got there first, wrote the first guidelines for Lyme disease, published a lot of the initial studies on Lyme disease. And this group, um, largely, you know, Infectious Disease Society of America researchers, the people who are on the you know, 2006 and now the 2019 or 20 um, Lyme disease guidelines, I guess the first ones were in 2001. Um, these folks have a certain view of Lyme disease and they've drawn conclusions about Lyme disease um, that um, they cling tightly to, um, in part, I think, because they have in, uh, invested careers Yes, the uh, IDSA guidelines basically um, define Lyme disease as an acute disease mm -hmm. that can be more or less readily diagnosed by virtue of the rash, the EM rash, or um, a um, form of test that works later um, in the illness and basically allows the spirochete to disseminate. But anyway, they maintain that their model of Lyme disease as an acute, readily treatable disease is the right one. And they have clung fiercely to that model for a very long time, even though there's a lot of evidence to uh, challenge it. And I just think they've invested so much of their careers in it. Um, um, they do have a certain body of evidence to support what they say. Um, so they can fall back on that and say, yeah, we got it covered, we're right. But what their model leaves out is an enormous and growing body of science that challenges them. And they don't want to let go of that status quo and they don't want to let go of that power. And one of the problems with this picture is that because they got to this early because they wrote the first Lyme disease guidelines. They had connections with at the highest levels of medical publishing. Excuse me, I'm sorry. So what's pro what the problem is with this um, model and this paradigm of, of how um, Lyme disease has been defined and treated and so forth, is that these research researchers, these physicians who got there early on, um, established connections with um, people in the US Centers for Disease Control, with people in the National Institutes of Health, um, at the New England Journal of Medicine, in other very respected journals, and by virtue of those connections, by virtue of their publications, one thing sort of um, set another thing in motion. And they could get published all around the world. They could get published in many places. The media trusted what they wrote um, and the statements that they made. And um, 
that's what happened. They just got there early. They um, were reinforced by the many connections they made early. They don't want to let go of that model of Lyme disease um, that says it's an acute disease and readily treatable. And um, as a result, many people around the world are suffering from a limited and frankly flawed view of what Lyme disease and tick-borne illness is. And so many thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people have been impacted, probably millions by that, yeah. that yes. stance being adopted globally, would you say? Yes. I mean, in the United States, we have about 300,000. One, one year, we, we uh, passed 400,000 illnesses a year. Um, and those are the ones that we more or less know of that have turned up in, um, um, uh, you know, by virtue of uh, science. Uh, let me start over again. Those are the ones that have tested positive for the illness or um, by virtue of insurance um, claims we know to exist. There's a lot more that are never identified and treated as something else. But among those 300,000, if we accept even what the IDSA accepts and the CDC accepts that 10 to 20% of those 300,000 don't get well with you know, short term um, doxycycline treatment, we're talking about 30 to 60,000 people a year who remain ill after treatment. And those are the people who are treated early. So the um, universe of people who are suffering from Lyme disease, who continue to suffer Lyme disease, I think we, we can just say it's, it's enormous. It is hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And so uh, you know, I've written some of what you've, I've read some of what you've written and you say that Lyme is spreading globally. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on um, any research confirmed or your research has confirmed around the spread via, you know, say maybe livestock or migrating birds, mm -hmm. trans pathogen loads. What do you think? Um, well, there's lots of evidence that um, ticks and infected ticks are moving around the planet. Um, I kind of did a deep dive into science when I wrote my book as to how climate change was pushing the disease and the ticks around the planet, but other things, other ways in which we have adulterated the natural world. You know, it's not just that we have a warmer planet. It's that we've cut up the forests. It's that we have less biodiversity. Um, it's that we have tons of these little mammals because they really um, do very well in the suburban ideals that, we that many of us live in and, and where, frankly, many of us become bitten and infected. Um, so we've created all of the kind of conditions. We put all of those, those elements in place to foster an epidemic. And um, we know that, for example, that um, ticks are living in places where they didn't live before because of scientific studies that we see. Um, you know, in Eastern Europe, for example, and I, I love scientists who do things like this, they climb mountains. And we have um, old archival data from, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. <coughs> we have old archival data from 40 or 50 years ago that shows where um, ticks could live up a mountain in the Bosnian Alps. Well, in the early 2000s, another um, scientist climbs uh, a mountain in that same area and finds, oh, uh, they're, they're living a thousand meters higher up. So they're, they're not only moving up latitudes, we know that. We see that in the Scandinavian Peninsula, for example. They've done studies along the coast and found that the, the ticks are migrating. But they're also, they're moving up mountains. Um, Canada is a real frontier, a new frontier for Lyme disease. Um, it frankly is where uh, we in New York were maybe 30 years ago in terms of it's coming on strong, doctors aren't prepared to, um, to treat it, they haven't been educated. Um, so there, there is a lot um, of evidence, there's a lot of science that, that tells us this is moving um, with gusto that it's not just Lyme disease either that's moving. 
um, we see um, the Lone Star Tech, for example, is um, spreading widely in the United States. Um, this is a tick that um, enjoyed the, you know, the hot, steamy weather of the American South for a long time and was pretty well known down there. Um, but now all of a sudden it's turning up in, in New York, on Long Island. Um, and beyond that, you know, it's also been found to be carrying something very interesting, a, a molecule basically that kicks off an, an, an allergy to red meat uh, and in some cases to dairy products in people who are bitten by this tick. Um, and to just illustrate for a second the global nature of this situation, um, this um, allergy that's caused by ticks was discovered by the joint efforts of an Australian um, allergist, I guess that's what that kind of doctor is called, by the name of Cheryl Van Noonan, and a group of doctors in Virginia in the United States. And interestingly, at about the same time, they were um, observing that people who um, were bitten by ticks um, would come in several weeks later with this very serious allergy. They'd go into anaphylactic shock in some cases and not be able to breathe. Um, and uh, it was Dr. Van Noonan who first made the um, connection to ticks. And it was the Virginia group that um, identified the molecule that causes the, um, the allergy. So that's just one kind of um, example of how global this is. And by the way, that allergy has now been identified in at least a dozen countries, um, including wow. in Japan. Wow. Um, and we're also seeing the, the list of um, tick-borne pathogens grow year to year. Um, maybe 10 years ago, there were um, maybe five or six known um, forms of Borrelia that could cause, um, you know, that ticks delivered. Now it's up to about 21 um, species of Borrelia have been identified around the world um, carried by ticks. Um, there's also um, studies that have been done in New York and Southern New York finding um, viruses. And um, of course, um, uh, Babesia um, uh, causing pathogen, a, a pathogen that causes Borrelia, I'm sorry, um, there was a study in Long Island that, you know, looked at a number of ticks and found, I think it was 17 different organisms, including the Lyme disease pathogen, including um, Babesia, the, which causes Babesiosis, which, by the way, will not respond to um, treatment with antibiotics, has to be treated with uh, anti-malarial drugs, often in combination. Um, but, you know, the list is just growing of pathogens that we're finding in um, ticks um, and, you know, really stressing that we need to pay attention to this um, global and growing epidemic. Mm. That's so interesting. Um, you didn't happen to be able to educate Professor Van Noonan on the fact that beyond the meat allergy, there's other pathogens that her patients may be sick with. Well, I was very impressed with her work on, you know, making the connect, connection between a tick bite and an allergy. Um, but no, I, I didn't have those <laughs> discussions with her. And I was just really kind of early in my, um, my research for my book when I made contact with her. If I had opportunity now, and maybe I'll go back to, uh, to doing so, um, I probably would ask her. Um, yeah. What she penny. thinks of the larger a uh, view of, you know, tick-borne illness in Australia. And, you know, I, I have uh, spoken to Australian um, physicians at um, conferences of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, also known as ILADS by its acronym. And, um, you know, I've been told that, you know, there is denial and they have such problems um, uh, getting any kind of support in the medical community. Um, one doctor who I quoted in my book um, said to me, um, as if, you know, birds don't visit, you know, um, don't fly into Australia from other places. Um, and that brings me to, you know, the role of birds in moving ticks around. 
Um, you know, a tick can only, um, you know, crawl a, a short um, distance in its entire lifetime, but if it's on the back of a bird, um, you know, it can go hundreds and thousands of miles. And um, there have been other scientific studies um, which have, you know, in which scientists have, have basically snagged thousands of birds. In one case, uh, um, on the southern border of the United States coming across the, the Gulf of Mexico. And then they, they, they look in the feathers of these birds, they pull out the ticks, they test the ticks, and then they're able to extrapolate and um, you know, estimate how many ticks are crossing the border into the United States. And also, you know, this has been done in Canada. And you know, there's literally millions of ticks being dropped. Um, but the difference is, you know, while um, ticks have been carried by birds for thousands of years for eons, um, they now are dropped into places where they can very readily survive, where there are more of them, where they're gonna meet up with a mate <laughs> and make more ticks. And that's the difference today from, from years ago. We've always had ticks, you know, we just haven't had as many. We haven't had as many um, carry, as many pathogens uh, inside them. Um, when I speak on my book, I show a slide of a, um, of a tick encased in amber from the Dominican Republic. And this little bit of amber is 15 to 20 million years old. Wow. And that tick looks very much like the ticks that I see uh, in my backyard today. But when they put that tick under an electron microscope, they saw these little coiled bacteria that is now considered to be the first evidence of Lyme disease 15 to 20 million years ago. Wow. So it's been around for a long time, but we have put all of the um, conditions in place to um, really make it explode on the, the, uh, the world stage in the 21st century. Oh, that's a scary thought. And just back to, I want to be um, generous to Professor Van Noonan because it is a very dire situation in Australia for doctors. Um, and so you do have to be very brave to stand out against so the status quo, so to speak. But she does live in one of the original hotspots and a very known tick hotspot of, of Australia. So I really hope that she does expand her view and even secretly give some antibiotic support to her mammalian meat allergy patients. So I'm going to send her, I'm going to send her my survey, Sharon. Oh, good. Idea. The one that I sent to, you know, researchers around the world. Well, I mean, science is going to answer it, isn't it? If you look at this with an open mind, you yes. know, it's illogical to be assuming anything else. Yes. And there has been just terrific science done, particularly within the last five years. Um, and on animals, especially, that show the Lyme disease spirochete surviving after treatment with antibiotics. And this has been reinforced many times in you know, monkey studies done at Tulane University. Um, there's a researcher there by the name of uh, Monica Embers. And um, she has done just terrific work in terms of um, in infecting um, these small rhesus monkeys um, with Lyme disease, both um, by injecting it and also putting infected ticks onto the monkeys. Um, she's proven a number of things in her experiments. She's proven that the uh, you know, typical test that we use for Lyme disease doesn't work in a number of cases with her monkeys. Monkeys she knows have been infected with Lyme disease. They don't mount they do. any anti, and they don't mount moreover any antibody response. So, for some reason, that happens with monkeys, and we assume with people. Um, she's also shown that she treats them. She treats them well, and just how we would treat people, you know, same drugs, doxycycline, and um, then she tests them later on. She actually euthanizes the animals in some cases. And she has found Lyme disease spirochetes, viable spirochetes in many tissues of these um, animals. She's found them in the brain. She's found them in the liver. Um, 
She's found them in the heart, um, places we know they go to in human beings. So she and others are really making the case for persistence, that this is a very, very crafty um, bacteria, that it finds ways to evade the mammal immune system. And, you know, she's done work as well as another uh, researcher at the University of California, Davis, by the name of Nicole Baumgarth. And she discovered a way in which Borrelia was able to essentially disarm the uh, immune system of mice. And what they did, it, what they do is they go into something called the germinal center, which is in lymph nodes, and just basically turns off the, the response to Borrelia. Um, you know, we found other experiments in which um, we've long known that this bacteria can change the way it, it appears to our immune system. It has different things on its coating. And um, so your immune system sees this bacteria, starts to um, respond to it, and then um, it changes how it looks to our immune systems. So we have a lot of, lot of, you know, just a growing body of evidence that suggests why this bacteria can cause so much damage and can evade our immune system. And there was even a, um, a paper that came out about a year ago. I wrote about it in an article on um, Huffington Post, if your um, viewers wanna look it up and just put in sleeper cells and my name and Huffington Post. And um, a uh, well-known researcher from um, New York Medical College, which is very interesting that he came out of, out of there and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, he basically looked at the body of research and he um, uh, wrote about what he termed to be sleeper cells, concluding that this evidence was growing that Borrelia survives survives our, our, you know, the best defenses of our immune systems and survives uh, antimicrobial antibiotic treatment. And it was a very powerful review of the scientific literature. And what was very interesting about it is it came out of New York Medical College where he does his research. And that's where a lot of the Lyme dogma has been born and upheld for many years. That's where the first author on the Lyme disease guidelines, um, Dr. Gary Wormser, has long practiced and has long done his research. And other researchers also come from there, uh, Dr. Nadelman and uh, Dr. Datweiler. These are folks, by the way, have been, who have been named in the lawsuit that's, um, that's been filed uh, against insurance companies. And we can talk a little bit about that. But it was very interesting that this came out of New York Medical College. And so there is growing acceptance. Um, is it, you know, universally accepted? No. Um, is there work to be done? Yes. But um, the evidence is growing that um, this is a very special kind of bacteria. And it has um, talents and abilities well beyond medicine's abilities to control it and to contain it. Wow. What, you know, you've got quite a unique global view, Mary Beth. What do, you, do you have any sense of the global prevalence? The prevalence of Lyme disease? Yeah, and, and friends and associated infections. Um, you know, what's the prevalence? I guess I can only look at the numbers, you know, in um, Europe, it's tough to get a grasp on, um, you know, how many cases there are there. There was one study done a couple of years ago, it estimated uh, 232,000 cases in Western Europe. Um, the EU put something on its website, um, uh, maybe a year or so ago, estimating, um, 600,000 to 850,000 cases annually. That's a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, as we know in the US, we say that there's 300,000 to 400,000 a year. Um, you know, it's in the millions. I think we can safely say that. It is in China. 
Um, and I um, also point to a study when I uh, speak publicly of um, 800 residents outside of, a, um, outside of Beijing in a suburb. And they studied these um, residents for the um, prevalence of Lyme disease. And I believe they found five to 10% with antibodies to Lyme disease. But one of the statements that they made in this study was um, that um, the problem of Lyme disease and of uh, lingering symptoms to Lyme disease is huge in China. This is a paraphrase. But it was a very you know, um, strong statement that wow. this is a problem in China. And it has been found in about uh, at 29 um, different uh, municipalities and provinces. Um, so, you know, China is a big country, <laughs> a lot of people there. It's in Russia. Um, it's, um, you know, outside of Moscow. Um, it's, it's in South America, though, um, you know, I, I have interviewed um, physicians down there who are, or researchers who are very frustrated at the attention it gets, which is virtually nil. Um, so, you know, it depends on how much we're counting and how much we're able to identify. And um, so it's really a very, very um, hard number to come to. Mm. So when you're not counting, you have a low prevalence. Yes, and when you're not looking, <laughs> you have a low prevalence, you know? Um, and, and um, you know, in, in areas of Canada, I spoke in Vancouver a couple of months ago where um, people still go to the doctor with a bullseye rash yeah. and they're told um, there's, there's no Lyme disease here in British Columbia. Um, and yet there are scientific publications that, that say it's there. Yeah. It's on the website of the, the uh, National Health Service there, but they're able to um, dismiss it because it's considered still to be rare. Um, and if you consider it to be rare, then you don't look for it, you play it down, you don't find it, and the numbers stay low. And that's why the work of you know, groups like yours, Sharon, is really important just in raising awareness, making a doctor think twice uh, about a rash, making sure that a patient advocates for him or herself when they go to the doctor and insists on treatment. You know, in the US, we can do that. We can insist on treatment. I'm not sure that you have that luxury in, in Australia. Um, but certainly people leave Australia and get infected elsewhere. Um, so, you know, that kind of thing is impossible to deny. Um, but, you know, we just have to start standing up for ourselves. We have to stand up for ourselves. We have to have advocacy groups speak for us. One of the things that um, is, is giving people a lot of um, encouragement in the United States is the involvement of nonprofit organizations. You know, in the US and everywhere else, it's not just middle class or poor people who become bitten by ticks and become infected. Rich people do too, people with resources. So what has happened in a number of uh, areas of the United States is um, nonprofit foundations have been formed and um, the people behind these, um, these foundations have invested a certain amount of money. The Alexandra and Stephen Cohen Foundation, yeah. for example, they've put $50 million toward Lyme disease. There's also the Global Lyme Alliance. There's Bay Area um, uh, Lyme Foundation. Um, there's uh, Focus on Lyme which is based in, um, in Arizona, of all places, where you wouldn't think there's Lyme disease and there's denial as well. But these groups are raising money among their communities um, and they are um, investing in research. Monica Embers at Tulane University, for example, has gotten grants from them to do studies. Um, they've um, underwritten a lot of um, studies on tests, on persistence, on what are the symptoms of uh, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And this is what is, is basically leading to this growing body 
of, of science that is challenging that Lyme disease paradigm. So that, you know, if you could get some uh, foundations going there, um, that would be very helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. I keep wanting to, I think we need to do a little prayer for the rhesus monkeys. My goodness, you wouldn't wish this disease on your worst enemy, no. would you? Yeah. No, but it is, you know, we do use the monkey model as yeah. the closest thing to the, the way human beings work and the way our immune system responds. So it is an accepted form of science and um, it's unfortunate that we have to do that. But um, there's also a, an awful lot of mice that are sacrificed to um, mm -hmm. Lyme disease yeah. research. And um, in, uh, at the University of um, California, Davis, uh, a Dr. Hodsick, um, along with um, Dr. Baumgarth, have uh, infected mice, have treated them, and um, have found 12 months later that the mice still have roaring cases of Lyme disease, even after treatment. So we're able to say that this disease doesn't go away by virtue of the ways that we treat it, at least in these mammals. Mm -hmm. And we need now, and we are starting to take that research and move it forward to um, how we treat Lyme disease on people. Absolutely, and I'll, I also wanna make a special mention to the Canadians, like it's inconceivable that they think ticks just stop at this imaginary line. And you know, you could say one thing about Australia, like we're a continent surrounded by water. Um, yes. And, but the Canadians, goodness, I was born and raised in Edmonton. And um, yeah, so hearts out to the Canadians that are fighting this battle as well. You know, and, and deniers in Canada, in Australia, have been empowered by yeah. the American model of Lyme disease care. And, you know, I started out by saying there are things happening that give us hope. And they're happening largely in the United States, and they'll help you out eventually. But I also have to say that it's our export of our medical wisdom <laughs> that have gotten us into this mess. It's by and large the American model of Lyme disease, diagnosis, treatment, care, persistence that um, has defined Lyme disease as this acute treatable illness. Yeah. So the, you know, America doesn't export much these days, but um, it's medical wisdom is still, you know, <laughs> respected around the world. Shared and generously and freely. Yeah. That's why many countries are in the fix that they're in. <laughs> I, um, I live on the um, fringe of a 12-acre uh, former cornfield. Okay. And um, it's a beautiful field. And um, we own just two acres of it, and a neighbor owns um, the rest. And we jointly mow a path around the field. So my neighbor does half the path. I do, we do half the path so that people can walk and not become infected uh, with Lyme disease because there's a great many ticks out there. And, you know, I, I moved here um, 36 um, years ago or so. And I, I look at that beautiful field in a much different way than I did back then. Um, you know, it's just fraught with anxiety and, you know, danger to a large extent. It's a threat to my children and my four grandsons. And um, it's, it's a shame that we have to live with this new reality, this new relationship with nature. But we do, and we have to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a fan and a lover of nature, and I live in a fully bush block surrounded by, in Australia, they call it state forest. And same mm -hmm. thing, I love looking at it, but I don't spend a lot of time emerging myself in it any longer. Yeah. Yes, we have to protect ourselves. I mean, I, I recommend um, permethrin, permethrin impregnated clothing. Mm. Um, you can buy it online. Um, it's clothing that's already been sprayed with permethrin, which is a um, well-tested um, chemical um, without a lot of drawbacks to people. I did a lot of research on it before endorsing it uh, in my book, book and in talks that I, I give. Um, and it um, kills ticks. 
it certainly keeps them off you, but even if they land on you or if they climb, try and climb up your sock or uh, which is treated or your, your trousers, they'll die. Mm. So it's very effective. I do recommend that. But um, we have to cover up. We have to take um, a lot of different measures to protect ourselves. We have to make sure our animals are treated. Um, and, you know, the irony is my dog can be get, get vaccinated. My dog um, can wear a collar that um, will kill the tick that tries to bite him. Um, you know, it's not good that he still needs to get bitten before the tick is killed. But, um, you know, there are steps that we can take to protect ourselves, to protect our, our um, dogs, and to protect our kids. You know, we need to check ourselves um, whenever we go outside. So, so um, what do you... Um... Have we, have we completed what you think is the solution to the politicization of this disease? Um, it is a highly political disease. And um, the reason for that, yeah, I do, I do have an opinion on that, is because of antibiotics. And um, just a, a handful of clinical trials which have shown that um, three months of antibiotics don't really help with, you know, protracted cases of Lyme disease. And um, those studies can be readily called into question. There are problems with those clinical trials. Um, first of all, one of them, there were two that were released um, in 2001. Yeah. Um, and um, one of them had what they call um, an arm of the study. There were two arms uh, in which they enrolled seronegative patients. That means patients who didn't test positive for Lyme disease. You'd never allow that ever these days. Um, the other thing is that um, there was a, a study done by a researcher, a statistical researcher at Brown University a couple of years ago. And she revisited those four major studies. And she found a lot of statistical problems with them. Yeah. They weren't big enough. They didn't enroll enough people. They didn't um, analyze the data in a um, meaningful way. They um, over um, expected in terms of improvement, like you had to improve a standard deviation above the norm in order to be counted as a success story, in order to be counted as a patient who improved um, um, by taking extra doses of antibiotics um, for this period of time. So they underestimated the um, improvement. Um, even one of the um, uh, uh, physician researchers who conducted the clinical trial, one of the four clinical trials um, named Brian Fallon, has said that his patients um, did improve in certain ways, in uh, fatigue, for example. And he feels that his um, uh, conclusions have been underestimated. And, you know, the, the reason that they have uh, largely dismissed um, uh, further courses of antibiotics goes back to those, those clinical trials. Those clinical trials, beyond being, you know, um, criticized as being underpowered or statistically flawed, also um, basically use the same uh, approach time after time after time. If it didn't work, you know, four times, then try something else. Mm -hmm. It used by and large the same drugs um, and the same, you know, we'll do a, a short period of intravenous and then oral antibiotics. And, you know, they've been able to use those um, four clinical trials to say no antibiotics, no long-term antibiotics for Lyme disease. It just doesn't work. They haven't tried um, other combinations of antibiotics, which some uh, re research is pointing to. Um, they haven't tried other drugs, for example, but they've been able to use those trials to say, to, to just close the door on a further treatment and even 
to shut the door on something called chronic Lyme disease. They don't have enough evidence to just summarily dismiss the potential for Lyme disease to be chronic based on those, those trials. So we need to keep doing more research. We need to build on the studies uh, in test tubes that are going on now, um, which show that other compounds, other antimicrobials work better than, for example, doxycycline. Um, but, you know, it also is related to this fear of overuse of antibiotics. Lyme disease is the, you know, poster child for, um, you know, overuse of antibiotics. Um, and it's not based on any good evidence. Um, if you go to the webpage of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the one about post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, it points to these studies that show um, damage done by um, um, treatment long-term uh, for Lyme disease in certain patients. And um, the evidence presented on that page is extremely thin. Um, they report a couple of deaths from extended use of antibiotics that led to um, infections because of the uh, intravenous treatment. They point to some um, problems with gallbladders and so forth. But, you know, aside from that, there's something like six or seven studies there, a handful of people involved who had bad responses, bad reactions, and sometimes bad, very bad infections as a result of being treated long-term with antibiotics. Um, at the same time, in the US, about 15,000 people die every year from C. difficile. It's, a, um, it's an infection, and it often results from um, use of antibiotics. 15,000 a year. And this page of the Centers for Disease Control has a handful of bad reports related to long-term antibiotic treatment for Lyme disease. And yet this huge deal is made of using antibiotics on, on people who continue to suffer from Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's not enough evidence to say um, that, that um, this causes such um, horrible you know, outcomes for so many people. Um, so what it is, is, you know, I don't, I don't contend that antibiotics are the be all and end all and the answer to this, but it's by and large, all we've got right now, as we muddle through this and try and figure this out. And there are other antibiotics in combination and alone that work better than the ones that we use right now. And one of the things that Dr. Horowitz highlighted is that both the ELADS and the IDSA guidelines are evidence-based and that physicians have the right to choose which one that they endorse. So how many people, you know, with, with this politicization that we're focusing on right now, what's your comments on how people are being harmed by the denial of treatment or the adoption of this post-treatment Lyme disease mm -hmm. label that has no evidence base? Well, I think... First of all, um, probably the, the biggest harm is that we have relied for 40 years, I think that 25 years, I think it was 1995, on a test that doesn't work. And we miss many, many cases. So, you know, first and foremost, we are allowing disease to fester. And we know that if you are belatedly diagnosed with almost anything, it's going to be harder to bring under control than if you're early treated. But we've also um, framed Lyme disease as, you know, relatively minor, easy to diagnose, easy to treat. Um, and we haven't prepared doctors to be super vigilant and to look for it and to treat it right away at the earliest sign, to give the benefit of the doubt to treatment rather than to not treating. And, you know, if we weigh the scales, 
the, you know, not treating is definitely um, favored in this whole paradigm of how we treat Lyme disease. If there's a doubt, don't treat because that's bad. You know, we can't, you know, use antibiotics for Lyme disease um, unnecessarily when we, you know, often use them for many other things. And, and I would argue that, um, you know, a short products early in this disease will prevent in many, many cases um, so much, um, uh, uh, you know, um, trauma and um, damage and um, disability that it outweighs any problems caused by unnecessary treatment with antibiotics. Um, so, you know, that, that definitely is something that we, we need to do. We need to um, alert doctors that they have to get on uh, the bandwagon. Um, I guess your question was, you know, what, what the harm ha that is that has been done. Um, you know, we've just clung to this model of, of Lyme disease. As I said, we, we've clung to a, a test that doesn't work. We've clung to treatments that don't fully resolve um, the disease. And when it's possible for even the, the people who uh, embrace the dogma to say that 10 to 20% of people remain symptomatic for a year or more after treatment um, and to dismiss those people is, is awful. And that's what we've done. That's what that model of Lyme disease has done. It's essentially written off that 10 to 20% of early treated people who stay sick. Um, they must be su suffering something else is, is how it goes. Um, so they go from doctor to doctor and they're treated for anxiety and they're treated for depression. They're treated for chronic fatigue syndrome for fibromyalgia, um, but it's, it's anything but lying often um, because we haven't tried to figure out how to treat those people. Mm. And so what there's been say, a lot of harm. Yeah, a lot, amazing harm, hasn't there, um, yeah. by this situation. What do you say to policymakers and doctors who persistently and committedly deny this disease? What's your call to action for them? For policymakers who do policymakers and, and leading doctors, so doctors who lead the fight, they almost do research to deny someone else's research as opposed to having mm -hmm. curiosity to further the cause, to find more evidence. Well, there was a, a a paper that came out today. As a matter of fact, I got it in my uh, inbox um, about the persistence research that I told you about that shows the Lyme spirochete surviving antibiotic treatment and basi basically um, disputing it all mm -hmm. and saying um, it hasn't proven anything that there are other reasons um, why people stay symptomatic. Um, and you know, I don't think that anyone's gonna win on the level of challenging that one particular researcher who's one of the core group who have upheld this dogma for a very long time. I think the progress is going to be made at the level of um, what you know you're doing in in Australia and what we're doing here. It's appealing to our legislators. It's um, you know getting them on board and um, educating them. Um, it's um, appealing to the public health officials um, it's, you know, even, um, having, um, you know, marches to, in front of city hall, uh, kind of thing. It's getting attention to your cause. Um, you know, calling newspapers and, uh, writing letters to the editor and, um, making noise that way. That's important as well. Um, I've written a number of, um, opinion pieces and, um, you know, people in the Lyme disease community have as well to, to make their case. Um, it, it's, it's all a process and it's going to take a long time. Um, but, you know, I, I think there is movement on this Lyme meter that things are, are moving, um, but it's a long, slow process. And um, I think I said before, um, but we, you lost, <laughs> you 
I was muted uh, in some way, that um, there's a kind of a cynical statement made by some Lyme disease doctors that um, science uh, advances one funeral at a time. So the old guard of Lyme disease, uh, they're aging. <laughs> They've been around for a long <laughs> time. <laughs> and um, the other problem is that there's a lot of Lyme doctors who are really good, who are also aging, and we need to bring more you know, young doctors in. But um, things will change eventually. Um, and it will be accepted um, as uh, someone from the Netherlands, one of the, the major um, uh, leaders over there said to me, it's going to be accepted as a normal disease um, and treated as such by 2030, he said. That's not soon enough for all of us, but um, he is very hopeful um, by what he sees now. How important do you think the legal case coming out of Texas is? Well, that's a really important case. And um, if anybody wants to get details about it, they can go to my website. I have a page um, devoted entirely to um, Tory v. IDSA, uh, which is the short uh, name for it. And um, I've written a number of articles about it. And you can also see a lot of the uh, filings. You can see the lawsuit itself. But this lawsuit um, is, is potentially very um, important and um, could change things. It has been filed by about 25 Lyme disease patients. And in a couple of cases by their estates, their, their survivors, um, against um, eight insurance companies, um, seven of the key Lyme disease uh, physician researchers who did a lot of the early research and are on the IDSA guidelines in some cases. Um, and um, the IDSA itself is also being sued. Um, and what it contends is that um, these folks, these entities all worked together to conspire to deny care to Lyme disease patients, that they um, got together and wrote up these guidelines that were beneficial for them as well as um, for the insurance companies. So, um, and in some cases, the um, physician researchers who wrote the, these guidelines for the insurance companies were paid to review claims. So it, it does contend that there's a money motivation behind what they did um, we'll see if they can prove that case. I'm not sure they can. Um, but one of the good outcomes so far is that one of the insurance companies has settled the case, um, is no longer a, a, a defendant in the case. Uh, what the insurance company paid, what it settled for, I don't know. But that's the assumption that it paid something to get out of this case, which is some, something of, I guess, an acknowledgement um, that there was um, some, something done, um, that there is some, something to this lawsuit. Let's just put it that way. So anyway, um, it's uh, supposed to go to trial uh, in February, or it was supposed to. Um, I think it's a few months off. There have been some hiccups and so forth. But it's, you know, it's been around about two years now. It was filed in 2017. So just the very fact that it still survives is a, a, a momentous uh, indicator that, you know, maybe something will happen on that level. Mm, absolutely. And so for Australia is listening today, keep your affairs and documents in order and, and track your <laughs> progress because there is hope for you. And um, Mary Beth, what would you like to say on that note for Australia, you know, Australian sick with uh, Lyme disease and associated infections and the doctors who are working so hard to treat them against such odds? What, what would you like to leave them with today? Um, I send, you know, to Australia and Australians suffering from tick-borne illness, um, my profound, you know, good thoughts uh, for recovery, for getting help, um, for breaking through the denial that you face down there. I, I hope for you that you can all find strength. Um, it seems very little that I can give to you. 
But as I said in the beginning, I think there is hope. I think we are making very big strides here in the United States on the level of getting a new test, on new treatments coming down the pike, on science that is showing that this organis organism can um, outwit our immune systems and our drugs, um, that it's very crafty. Um, there's a lot of good things happening. So, you know, I would urge you to hang in there to keep doing what you're doing, to organize, to write to your members of parliament. I'm not sure what you call them there, is that right? Okay. Um, to, to agitate, um, to you know, um, defend your doctors. You know, we've had the problem here in the United States and we still have it here in New York where doctors are investigated by the licensing board. We have even a law in New York that says you cannot be brought up on charges simply because of how you choose to treat Lyme disease. Nonetheless, they find reasons to investigate doctors for the way they keep their records and silly things like that. Um, so, you know, defend your doctors. Um, try and get that kind of law passed. Um, maybe take a page out of some of the things that we've done up here, but be strong. You know, it, it won't be like this forever. Things are happening and we will make progress. Mm. Against there's power, the there's power yeah. in alignment, isn't there? When people come together and um, use their yes. combined voices. There's power in numbers. And, um, you know, one of the, you know, quote unquote, good developments in the last couple of weeks um, is that a major um, figure in pop music announced that he had Lyme disease, that he had suffered for a long time from Lyme disease. And this is Justin Bieber I'm referring to is a very, very big figure in music. And it's terrible for him. And I, I, you know, my sympathies and my, you know, all that good energy I'm sending you goes to him as well. I, I, I hope he does okay. But the fact that someone on his level came out and said, I went to a bunch of doctors and I wasn't diagnosed right away and I suffered and um, people denied that I was sick. That helps a lot of people. Mm. So, um, you know, you can point to him um, and, um, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, it's going to change. Thank you, Mary Beth, and God bless. I know that you would have made a difference to mm -hmm. Australians listening to this. Thank you, Sharon. It's my pleasure. Thank you.